Corinthians. We looked at their mindset. He started at the beginning. Paul started at the beginning talking about the necessity of Christ, the importance of Christ. And then as we got into the second part there, verses 10 through um, 17, we saw how divided they were over factions because they were looking at all of these other things. They were looking at, you know, Paul, who he was, Apollos, Cephas, or Peter. They were looking at, they were dividing over personalities. They had their eyes on other things. They had a worldly perspective. And now, then we saw in verse 17, at the end of that, as Paul, it's one of those transition sentences that he uses in between paragraphs when he says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. This important phrase like here, from here, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect or that it should have no effect on our lives. And that's what we're looking at today, the perspective of the cross or from the cross. Beginning here in verses 18 through 25, we read, for the message of the cross is foolishness, to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So the message of the cross is the wisdom, the very wisdom and power of God, as Paul describes here. It destroys the wisdom of the world, as it says in verse, verses 18 through 20. You know, many today, even among those who profess themselves to be believers, they've begun to take the cross as being foolish and absurd. Like, why would God do that? It doesn't make sense to them. There are those who call themselves progressive Christians. And what's meant by that is they've begin, begun to take on the philosophy of the world so that they, beginning, they begin to look at things like the world does. I mean, the cross is... Absolutely exclusive. Totally exclusive. And the world doesn't accept that. And when you have, again, those who profess to be believers and say that the cross isn't necessary or that one I've heard lately is, oh, that's Western Christianity. As if Eastern, if we were, you know, more Eastern, like the Eastern Orthodox or whoever, then we'd have better understanding. So there's this, but when you go by the word, strictly from the word, what do you get? The cross. The centrality of the cross. 
Turn with me for a second to Colossians chapter 3. Here's the importance of it that we need to see. How it applies to our lives personally, especially as believers. Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, we read, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Again, we're talking about having that perspective from the cross. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. Here we get it, guys. Here's the personal application. Pay attention to this. For you died. Now, is there any flexibility on that? When a person dies, is there an option for something else? You're die. You're dead. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in, in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, notice, Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Paul said to the Galatians also, you know, speaking of himself, taking the same truth and applying it to himself, he said, for I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but, li but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, in these flesh and bones here, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, the cross is central. You can't get around it. It destroys the wisdom of the world. The world is saying, and you even, again, see this in Christian circles when you try to, when, you know, Barna does these surveys often about, you know, the thinking and the positions within the church and growing numbers of people who, again, claim to be Christians are saying, well, there's other ways to be saved other than Jesus. Well, then they don't understand the cross. But it steps in there and it destroys the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of this world is what? We can think of a better way. We can do something ourselves in order to help ourselves along. That's what you have with this modern progressive Christianity. Now, that's words only come up, that expression's only come up in the past couple of years. You knew it before that as the emergent church. So it went kind of from liberal Christianity, and it's, that's all it really is, liberalism, kind of morphed into a modern expression with postmoderns as the emergent church, and then that's become, that's become the progressive church because they need to rename and remarket themselves because it's the same old foolishness that say that the cross was unnecessary. Wow, if the cross was unnecessary... And it's like saying, how stupid is God? What a position to take that he would do something totally unnecessary. So, and we even have theologians today. The famous British theologian, N.T. Wright, recently, and a lot of evangelicals have you know, used him as a source and listened to his teaching. N.T. Wright said that he no longer believes in, and here's the heart of the matter with the cross, the substitutionary atonement of Christ. So you see, that's what the world thinks is unnecessary, the substitutionary atonement. That's the fact that Jesus had to die for my sins on the cross so that I can have life in his name. So his righteousness is then imputed to me because he took my sin and I can spend eternity with God. 
That's what they're poo-pooing today. And saying, ah, oh, the whole idea of... But I like what John MacArthur, he had a little video, or it was on YouTube, a little video clip of him commenting on what N.T. Wright said. And his comment is, N.T. Wright is N.T. Wrong. <laughs> um, because of that, that's the, we're getting to the heart of what it means to be a Christian. And we're in this day, I believe it's this time when as we're drawing close to the end, we see what the scripture said was going to happen. Apostasy. People falling away, people who had claimed to be believers, they'll pick up on this sort of stuff and they'll go their way. Go their way. And what did John say in 1 John? They went out from among us because they weren't part of us. If they were part of us, they would have stayed. There's no gospel without the message of the cross. No gospel without the message of the cross. What's the good news? Hey, we can work this all out ourselves. How long have we been trying that? Uh, let me see, 6,000 years? But Paul said later in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, said, for I delivered to you first of all that which I received. Where did he receive it from? He received it from the Lord. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And you know, you can even go back to the Old Testament. He wasn't talking. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. Most of the New Testament we didn't have there yet. So he's talking about Genesis 3.15. That the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent, but his heel will be bruised by the serpent. We're talking about Genesis chapter 22, verses 119 through 19, where Abraham is taking Isaac to offer him uh, as a burnt offering as God commanded him. As he's going up there with Isaac, and Isaac's carrying the wood up the hill, and Isaac says to him, Father, we have the wood, we have the fire, we have all this stuff, but where's the lamb? Abraham's response was, the Lord will provide himself the sacrifice. Then you get to the end of the passage. You know, he said the Lord will provide a lamb. They get to the end of it, you know, where the angel of the Lord and the angel of the Lord's a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. So it's Christ himself telling him not to kill his son. And then he turns and there's a ram in the thicket. And he takes that and offers it. Notice, it was a ram. It wasn't a lamb. The Lord will provide himself the lamb. And then at the end of the passage, after that, Abraham says, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be done. The mount of the Lord, right there where he had offered Isaac, then... That's where they built the temple, ultimately. That's where the, the temple, when you see pictures of the temple mount, that's where Abraham offered Isaac, Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah goes on further up. It's been carved out some since then, but what we call Calvary. Mount Calvary, Golgotha, is part of Mount Moriah. So in the mount of the Lord, it shall be done. It shall be accomplished. Psalm 22, the psalm of the cross. He's pierced my, pierced my hands and feet. My 
tongue cleaves to my jaw. All these descriptions there, I'm just a worm, not a man. Description there prophetically of what Christ would say. And then, of course, Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 6. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Interesting, when Peter quotes that later, he changes it. He says, and by his stripes we were healed because Christ had already been to the cross. So, though Paul here finds his authority for his statement in the word of God, quoting Isaiah 29, 14, when he says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. The standard for what we believe is the inspired, inerrant, and authoritative word of God. The message of the cross is, if you haven't noticed, these days especially, countercultural. You know, you ever wonder, you, you mean, you think of back then the Jesus movement and people getting saved back then, you know, I, I thought it, it came to me, it was kind of like a, uh, a fit in the sense that, you know, they were the whole thing about the whole hippie movement was counterculture, being countercultural. And then God moved, God used that circumstance this, in situation to reveal his son to them. And they thought, oh, who's more countercultural than Jesus? The fact that the world is saying all of this stuff, but God said, and as we'll see, as he said there, even in verse, the beginning of verse 19, it is written. Now, I'm not going to hit the pulpit because the last time I quoted that because the emphasis on that expression because it is a declarative statement. I hit the other pulpit and I broke it. So I won't do that this time. Don put a lot of work into this. It's probably more solid, but... Um, so the message of, of the cross is countercultural, not going along with the changing philosophy of the world. And so you see, that's what progressivism tries to do. Just everything's fluid, everything's changing. But God said... And when God said anything, it ends the conversation. It ends the discussion. You know, you hear the expression, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's wrong. God said it, so that settles it, so I believe it. It's not settled because I believe it. It's settled whether I believe it or not. But that's why I believe it, because it's settled, and God said it. Now, God will destroy, it says, the understanding of those in the world who claim to have understanding. The scribe, the wise, all of these other people, the disputer, as it refers to here in verse 20, is um, a learned person that loves to argue. You ever know any of those people who come across? The people that just love to argue with you for the sake of arguing? But God has made the, the wisdom of this world foolish. The word expressed there, it says it made him come to nothing or it just made it flat and tasteless. You know, when you know Jesus and you've experienced life in him and then you hear what pe people in the world are thinking, like, it's incredible to me. And they're pushing it so much in the movies, especially, you know, like the Marvel movies and stuff like that, the multiverse. And 
we, what were we watching? Oh, I know. We watched the, we turned it off for a while out of frustration, but we went back and, on Disney Plus and watched the Loki series, if anybody, you know, cares. <laughs> but, but it was wild to me, you know, and they've gotten so much into the multiverse, and it's like, hey, they have this reality and this reality over here and another reality and, and all, all of this, you know, and it kind of fits into modern philosophy, make your own reality. You know, there's got to be a universe somewhere you can fit into, you know, that kind of thing. And it's all up to you anyway. But it was interesting. They come to the end and they, you know, it's, and it comes to this point of frustration because, you know, and it never, and I looked at it and at the end I thought, you know, you never dealt with the whole area of death. All you've done is say, there's this universe, and, but what about when you die? And you just simply didn't deal with it. You just simply didn't deal as if, you know, are you presuming you're going to live forever? And that's often what man will do in, in their plan, their scheme, and their whatever is, have you ever looked at, you know, some of these this decisions the world leaders are making and trying to manipulate and control everything. And that when I look at him, I think, don't you realize, dude, you're going to die? You think you control over all of this? You're going to die and it's going to be gone. Whether it be a Soros or any of those other people, uh, Gates or whoever trying to, you know, maneuver, manipulate things. Dude, you got something to deal with. There's no wise person. And the reason all of that falls flat, <coughs> excuse me, is that no one can do what Jesus has done. Nobody can accomplish what Jesus has accomplished. That in him, imagine that. For God so loved the world, this simple statement that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Total. Totally deals with everything. And they still can't figure it out. So don't get sucked into the world's way of thinking. That thinking like, oh, there must be, you know, so often of, of what kind of stimulates this progressive thinking is, well, basically a couple of things. One is not knowing their Bibles in the first place. And it's amazing to me some of these different preachers, pastors who say these things and think, dude, have you read your Bible? It's just how can you read your Bible, believe it, and still think what you excuse me, what you think. But, you know, on the one hand, it's people that don't know their Bibles, oftentimes don't have a close relationship with the Lord, aren't really spending time with him, and then they come across people that have a different frame of reference, different lifestyle, and they think, well, they, they're a nice person, you see, that's the deception right there to think that they're a nice person because none of us are in and of ourselves. You see, that's the fallacy. That's the confusion that the world has is we start from we're all good. I'm okay, you're okay. Remember that book? That's... You know, hey, I'm okay, so we can get along. We're all okay. You're starting in the wrong place. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Now, 
the truth of the gospel as well is demonstrated in its ability to do just what God said it would do, change lives. Change lives. You know people like that. Hopefully you are one. That because you heard the gospel, it changed the whole and received the gospel, received the truth, that it changed the whole trajectory of your life. I know what I was like before. None of you knew me back then. I was a mess. The trajectory I was headed toward was hopelessness and destruction. I had gotten to the point, I didn't know at any time anymore what to think. But God took that opportunity when I'd gotten to the end of myself to reveal his son to me. Because at that time, when I was at that point, I had stopped doing drugs because I just, it wasn't that I was trying to clean myself up. I just saw the uselessness of it. It didn't mean I was any better off. It was just, I was sober. But then two people who are close to me died. And it started that thinking in my mind that there must be more to life than this, than just living a little while and dying. There must be more to life than this. And so the God, over time, brought me to himself. Now, in verse 21, we see just that, as we see that God saves those who believe. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Think about that, the incredible transaction that takes place in a moment. The here to think that this, you know, man is out there and still coming up with all his wild philosophies like the multiverse and all of those kind of wacky things. And God use, uses none of it. None of man's philosophies. But he chooses simply by the message of the gospel preached. And like with Paul, remember when Paul was before Agrippa, when he said, Paul, your much learning has driven you crazy. He said, no, nah, I speak simple wisdom to you. Because the message of the cross, simply that whoever receives him receives the sacrifice of Christ for our sins on the cross. To him, he gives the right, the power, the authority to become children of God. Simply by the message preached. And see, that's why we need to be careful. That's why we need to not be confused. You know, we think, well, how do we reach people? And yes, yeah, sometimes we, you know, we do things to get opportunity to share, but it always has to come down to sharing the gospel. Because if you don't share the gospel, that's what has the power. That's where the power is in the gospel. It's not, the power isn't in any nice story I tell. The power isn't in some activity we do. And the activities we do, you know, like when we have family fun days or whatever, you know, there's no, nobody's going to get saved sliding down a slide. But the point at which we do things is to give an opportunity to share the gospel. Simple as that. That's the only reason for doing it. 
Yes, we can help people even when we do things like uh, the homeless ministry. Yeah, we can share things with homeless people. We can give them food or whatever so that they're not hungry, but you can have a full stomach and go to hell. Our ultimate goal is always the gospel. Always the gospel. Has to be. Because beyond that, we're only helping people temporarily. We're putting a Band-Aid on cancer. And as Paul says here, as Paul said um, in Second Wait a second. Well, in uh, chapter 2, later in verse 14, he says, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Again, that blow, totally blows the world's mindset away. In fact, God intentionally offends the wisdom of man all the time. He intentionally offends it. He does it by making salvation possible by believing the simple message of the gospel when it's proclaimed. Now, in verses 22 through 24, we see that this message is applicable to everyone. As he said, the Jews request a sign and Gentiles or Greeks. It says Greeks here, but it's talking about those people who are following Greek philosophy. It's not talking about nat national Greeks. The Greeks look for wisdom. Jews look for a sign, an attesting miracle. But remember, in Matthew 12:39 Jesus said, said but he said answered and said to them an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah sign of the prophet Jonah 3 night 3 days 3 nights in the belly of the fish in the same way, the son, man will be three days, three nights in the heart of the earth, he said. So that he would suffer on the cross, die, and be raised in three days. The Jews stumble over Jesus because they, he didn't meet their changing expectations. At first, you know, they, they said, they approached Jesus and said, Oh, what sign do you give us? And you know, he's going around healing people, raising people from the dead, and, you know, stuff like this. Well, what sign do you give us? And then, you know, after that, they start saying, well, we need a sign from heaven. That was a unique sign. You know, like, like Moses, he gave us manna, came down from heaven. What are you doing? And so, as I said, they changed they changed the goalpost as they were doing that, and that's what often happens when people look for signs. On the other hand, those who followed the Greek culture wanted a message that really sounded intellectual. So Jesus offends everyone. It doesn't make sense to them that God would do something that would violate their pride. But that's exactly what he does every time. Does it to me rather often. But the message that will truly change a life is that Jesus died for our sins on the cross and that those who receive him will have eternal life. And as we've seen that the message of the cross is still contrary to the thinking of man. Obviously, it seems even more obviously so. Now, in verse 25, 
we see that it even surpasses the wisdom of man. As it says there in verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What's more foolish than Jesus going to the cross? They look at strength. They look to strength, referring to that power or in a sense a sign the weakness of Jesus going to the cross is stronger than anything that any man could ever do now in verses 26 through 31 you see Paul's kind of developing it here first he talked about you know the message of the cross and being the wisdom and power of God, now he goes in verses 26 through 31 to apply it to the Corinthians and state that it's the message of the cross that we glory in. As it says... For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world to, uh, and the uh, things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that as it is written he who glories let him glory in the Lord remember going back to the perspective where the Corinthians were coming from bragging about things oh I'm of Paul I'm of Apollos I'm of Cephas you know I'm of Jesus I'm the really spiritual guy because I just focus on Jesus. Paul comes to him here and says, you know, again, talking about the power of God, but then comes to the Corinthians and basically says, hey, guys, for you see your calling. There's not many wise according to the flesh. So what he's saying here is most of us, we're nothing to brag about. You know, take an honest look at yourself. You're really nothing to brag about. They were wanting to get caught up in the pride trip, but he tells them to take a good look at themselves. They still have no right to think of themselves as better than anyone else. They were thinking, hey, You know, we're Christians now. We're a good position, you know. And again, people can take that to themselves and think, you know, I'm saved. I'm one of the chosen and get a big head over that. But it's by Christ, as he says here, by his grace that we're in him. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So there weren't many there that were clever. There weren't many that were influential in society. In fact, when we take a real look at it in society today, when they find out you're a Christian, they usually disregard you. It 
And there were not many who are born into a position of status. Now, they were trying to use these standards to judge Paul. In a sense, what they were doing was practice, where they were being snobs. They were simply being Christian snobs. And there's nothing worse than a Christian snob to think that they're better than other believers. Because we who were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made alive. What does a dead person have to brag about? My worms are bigger than yours? What? I don't know. It just makes no sense. We're in that position. We're not better off than anyone else. But it's by the grace of God that we're in him. And we should apply that to others as it says in verses 27 through 29 that no flesh would boast in his presence. As it says, he's chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. And how can you tell that? He chose you. He chose me the foolish things of this world, the things that the world disregards. Why did so many, you know, again, looking back to the Jesus movement, so many people, so many of those guys get saved back then? When you read the accounts like in the book Harvest, the accounts of the different Calvary Chapel pastors that got saved and God used them. And you just saw, you know, not many wise, not many noble or called because, hey, they were bikers. You had guys like Mike McIntosh who thought he lost half his brain because he was near a gunshot when he was on drugs. And... This the scripture says, and such were some of you. But you were changed by the gospel. You weren't chosen because you were great, but because God is. He demonstrates that our standards are not his. As it says in Isaiah 55, verses 7 through 9. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon for our for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So keep yourself in perspective. When you talk about what's going on in your life, when you talk about what God's doing in your life, who gets most of the credit? I mean, we're all tempted in the stories we tell to make ourselves look good. But in that, as he says there, if anyone glories, as we see in verses 30 through 31, we can only glory in what the Lord has done. God doesn't just want to give us things. He wants to be those things to us. And all that we have is because of Jesus. Jesus' positive righteousness applied to our lives because of the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him.
we change by focusing on Jesus and not on ourselves. If you want to brag about something, brag about what the Lord has done in your life. Now, in this third part here, now Paul's talked about the wisdom, the cross being the wisdom of knowledge of God. Now he's talked about to the Corinthians and that's how you were saved in the first place. It's not because you were anything great. And now in chapter two, verses one through five, he takes it and applies it to himself here as he says, and I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So, we see in verses one and two there that we should stay focused on Jesus and the cross. Paul describes how the reality of the cross was demonstrated in him. In Acts chapter 18, Paul had just left Athens. Now, remember when he got to Athens, he got in a real heady conversation with everybody about the unknown God. And he told them, well, the God that you worship in ignorance, I'm here to preach to you. And he kind of came from a philosophical position there. Goes to Corinth. And he had very short ministry there in Athens. Goes to Corinth. He says, I determined not to know anything to you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. He ends up being there a, a year and a half and sharing with them, continuing to share with them the gospel and discipling them. So he didn't come to them, to the Corinthians, as a philosopher or a salesman, but as a witness of the work of God in Christ. You see, if he had been trying to please his audience, imagine he hears that these guys are joining different camps and he tries to figure out for himself, well, how am I going to please those people who are of Apollos? Or how am I going to please those people who say they're of Peter? Or how am I going to please those selves, guys who think they're really spiritual and say, hey, we're of Jesus? How do I please those people? He did it the right way. He didn't try to please any of them. He simply preached Christ and him crucified. Not trying to get it, you know, because you simply can't. You simply can't. If he had been trying to please them, he would have pleased no one. We need to be careful of getting in the way of the gospel when we try to share it. Heard this story. Little kid. Who um, was in church. Now, they had a visiting pastor there that day who was a shorter man. Now, like many churches, behind the pulpit there was a cross, and normally the regular pastor was much taller. And this little kid said to their mother after the service, and said, oh, I saw the cross. I said, how do you, you know, what are you talking about? Oh, oh finally discovered there's a cross up there. I said, yeah, the man got out of the way. I could see the cross. How many times do we do that? Do we stop people from seeing the cross? Because we get in the way by trying to appeal to them in other ways. When our job, our responsibility is just to present the cross.
Now, in verses three through four, we see that we depend in that, as Paul, upon the working of the Holy Spirit. As he said to him, he was there in weakness and fear and much trembling. My speech and my preaching were without persuasive words of man's wisdom. He deliberately avoided making or doing anything that would entertain them. And we know from elsewhere in Scripture that he had some physical condition that he used to really relate to him because he said, I came to you in weakness. You know, some believe that he had an eye condition, that his eyes regularly ran, and, and so, you know, he wasn't physically appealing to people. And so he used that to say, I came to you in weakness and fear. How did he come to him in fear? That fear to think, you know, that I could get that concern that he could get in the way. That through the way he shared things, what he said, I mean, think about it. He was the, one of the smartest people at the time. Brilliant man. Again, as Agrippa said to him, hey, your much learning has driven you crazy. And what scared him, one of the things that scared him the most is that he would do something that would get in, get in the way of people hearing the message of the cross. He knew that if God didn't do what needed to be done, then it wouldn't get done. Our job is always to preach and then to allow the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do. Sharing the message and letting the Lord do his work. And then in verse five, we see that our faith must be in God and not in man's wisdom. As he said, that your faith should not be in the, men, the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Our faith can't be an emotion, entertainment, personality. What you use to draw people in is what they'll do, is what they'll be about. If you use entertainment to draw people in, you have to keep entertaining. You know, if... If, you know, we had smoke and mirrors up here and a lot of people came in for the smoke and mirrors, they, they might keep coming in, but they'd come for that and they'd think, well, what's the next thing you're going to do? And it'd always be the next. And that's why you hear about um, pastors doing some wild things. So... If, and the same is true with persuasive argument, if it's about persuasive argument, if someone can argue you in, then you can be argued out. And see, that's what's going on. We have people today, uh, those in the Christian music industry, I'm hearing about several people who say they're deconstructing their faith. And what that means is they don't really believe what they used to believe. They're really thinking it. And you'll have, let me, you know, you have very well-known Christian uh, I'm almost, I almost use the word entertainer because that could possibly be the case that now say, well, they start affirming things like gay marriage. Because, again, they know a person. And so then, because they know a person, they have to interpret the scripture differently. 
resting in the wisdom of man, but not in the power of God. The focus is to be on God and not any men, any man or woman, including ourselves. We need to trust God in alone, alone and completely. The cross is the central focus of the power of God, the cross. What he accomplished on the cross. When he there on the cross said, it is finished. Final statement, done, done deal. So, the question for us is, do we look at our lives from the perspective of the cross? And again, what is that? The fact that you're dead. You've been crucified with Christ. And your life is hidden in Christ with God. So that now, everything I look at everything I experience has to be viewed from the perspective of the cross. And Paul, to the Romans, in Romans chapter 6, he asked the rhetorical question, hey, you know, since we're saved by grace, he said, should we go on sinning that grace should abound? So we just experience more grace because we go on sinning? He says to him, God forbid, may it never be. Because if you're dead to cry, if you're dead to sin, why should you live in it any longer? That's the perspective. When you get tempted, when you're faced with situations, when you have the world pushing in on with its philosophy. Do you know the simple biblical answer to that, that when the temptation comes is I'm dead to that because you are. If you are in Christ, that's the choice you have. Before you were a Christian, you didn't have a choice. You did however the flesh led. But now... You've been given a new nature. As Colossians says, he's taking you, transported you from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of his dear son. He's given you a new nature. So now that you can choose. You can choose. You don't have to go that way anymore. You don't have to live in sin any longer. But you can live, as the scripture said, your life is hidden with God in Christ with God. That we can have victory. We don't have to live in defeat. That's what the incredible thing to me is. As Paul again said to the Romans, sin shall no longer have dominion over you because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. Grace, where does grace come from? The cross the cross. Are we seeing life from the cross? Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, just how incredible it is. Lord, help us not to lose sight of the cross. It's where we receive the forgiveness of sin. It's where we died to ourselves. And Lord, it's where we begin to live for you. And it seems in our lives from time to time, we just need to go back to the cross. And remember what you've accomplished on our behalf. Father, so I just pray for each one of us here, Lord God. that we see all that you accomplished for us and live in victory because of it, Father. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.